Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see everybody here on a, it looks like the first of a winter's day at last. Before we look into God's word, shall we just have a word of prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We do thank you for this day, for the beauty of it. Thank you for the beauty of creation that reminds us that there is a living God, one who created all things and they were perfect. He saw them and they were very good. And Father, we thank you that as part of that creation, we were designed and made to worship our God. We do pray this morning that it might be as we study your word, that we will have a, a greater appreciation of who you are. And Father, as we look into this book of Mark and we see something of the Savior, of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his greatness, that we might be drawn to him more and more. Father, encourage our hearts as we study. Help us to listen. Pray that what is said might honor and glorify you. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Giving thanks. Amen. We're going to get, uh, carry on in the, in the book of Mark again. We're going to look at uh, Mark chapter 4 uh, and then into 5. So we'll start with the uh, the sea being stilled. The, uh, when you look at the, uh, the section we're covering this morning, you see something of the power and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ um, exemplified and um, just, just how awesome his power is and who he is more and more as we read these passages. So chapter 4 and verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great wind storm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillar. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, Immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had been off bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of him, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine were feeding near, where the, the, near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and were drowned. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Uh, but Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends 
and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has been had compassion upon you. And he parted and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. And when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned round in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some, of, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make you this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kuma, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. May the Lord will add a blessing to the reading of his word. In these verses, we see something of the power of the Lord demonstrated. Last week, we saw something of the teaching of the Lord through the parables and the application of them, the selection of the 12 disciples and the challenge to us to obey him and follow him, despite any circumstances that we might find ourselves in. And we'll find as we look through today's reading, as we've read those words, that theme will continue. We also saw the opposition continuing as Satan, having failed to cause the Lord to falter, continues in more and more subtle ways to pre prevent him working, uh, to, to try and make him less effective. In all of which Jesus demonstrates his servanthood to his father only and continues to fulfill the work of him who sent him. There were the friends who considered him to be beside himself or having lost the plot and come to rescue him from himself before he burned himself up or was killed by others. Maybe they had heard the rumours about plots to kill him that we thought about previously. Then his mother and family come, possibly at the instigation of his friends, all genuinely concerned, but none with the insight of what drove him and how perfect the servant would carry out the work laid out before him by his father. Read of these things in the light of scripture and should take care in our concerns for others that we do not distract from the work for God because it, it makes us uncomfortable to see those who are making every endeavor. This theme of discouragement continues. There are subtle ways in which those who are well intentioned can try to affect the work. The narrative breaks down into four sections. We see the storm and the sea in which the Lord's power to restore order in nature 
is displayed. The healing of the man possessed of demons, the Lord's power to restore the mind, to control demons. The healing of the woman with the hemorrhage, the Lord's power to restore the body. The raising of Jairus' daughter, the Lord's power to restore the spirit. The incidents recorded here in these verses should be enough to convince anyone who takes time to look that this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is God. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, has the ability to control all things and is able to prove his universal dominion. There is not one area of life untouched in these few verses that the Lord does not have a power and authority over. The first thing we consider is the storm on the sea, the Lord's power to, rest to restore order in nature. We notice in the reading it was after a full day, it's now evening, and the Lord enters a boat with his disciples along with a number of others. They set off for the other side. We're reminded that the, in, in this book that the pace of the work is relentless and the wisdom of choice of fishermen as disciples is clearly evident as they are able to work and use of long, hard hours. And being able to sail allows for shortcuts across the lake to get to the other side, a swifter form of transport from place to place, reducing the throng of the crowd for a period. And traveling under cover of darkness prevents easy uh, following unless you have a boat, of which there were a few that followed them in this case. As fishermen navigate by the stars or the shape of the horizon would be natural, they didn't raise any objections to the rest to the request to sail into the night as they cross the lake. There's no indication of objection to the required effort after a long day or concern about the weather but for these experienced men. As with any direction of the Lord, there is never any whim to his request. Let us pass over to the other side. It's an area they've not visited much, if at all, but there is purpose in the desire to go to the other side. I was reminded of the woman at the well, where the Lord says, I must needs go through Samaria, and the disciples had no idea why. He had a purpose for the visit of which others did not know or understand. Here, the visit to the other side res result in great rejoicing and salvation of the soul. Did you notice the 15 ands throughout the section of the passage and continues to mark the pace of the book as the events unfold? As I read it, it's almost as if the writer cannot wait to get out all those things he wants to say unless he forgets the detail. It is simple but incredibly powerful writing of what the witnesses see of the power of this one who was sleeping in the boat. One other advantage of sailing is the opportunity to get a little sleep as the boat travels from one place to another. We see the human nature of the Lord as he gets in the boat and he immediately falls asleep in the rear on a pillow, exhausted. He was not just resting, he was in a deep sleep, so tired that he remains asleep when the wind picks up which the area is known for because of the shape of the land around. Suddenly, swirling winds are known to happen without warning. The waves start to pick up with the wind, so much so that the water is pouring into the boat. Have you ever been, ever sailed or been in a boat at sea when the waves pick up and the boat starts to put water on board, no matter how big or small, it's very frightening. But the size of the swell and the violence of the wind it meant that even those hardened sailors were afraid that they were about to drown. This is no ordinary storm, and they recognize the danger they are in. Here they now decide it's time to wake the sleeping Jesus at the rear of the boat. The peace that surrounds him as he sleeps points to the fact that no matter what happened in the storm, his heavenly father would ensure that his will was done and there was nothing to fear. And Jesus knew that. There was nothing that could cause the Lord to be disturbed, such as his faith in his father. Here is the perfect example of what a perfect walk with God looks like in practice. 
The parallel passage in Jonah comes to mind as he sleeps while the sailors battle the heaving seas. But he has no control over the waves, nor do they. And it's running from God. And there's no peace in that boat until he's out of it. There are two things that are on display. The Lord's faith in his Father's will and the lack of faith of the disciples. Although they had no doubt about where the, the answers to the problem lay, they were not able to trust that the outcome was secure. The peace and security of the master is in stark contrast to the fear and fervor of the disciples as they rush about the boat, trying to empty and steady it in the latching wind and the heaving waves. And finally, when they had run out of ideas and ability to do anything about the storm, probably slightly frustrated that while they struggled and battled the storm, which battered them, and those with, who were there uh, alongside them probably soaked through, the Lord Jesus just slept. And finally, they waken, no idea of what he will do, but at last they commit their recovery to the only one who can save them. So often it is not until we get to the point that we ask that point that we ask the Lord's help, isn't it? So often we get into trouble. So often things are going badly and we struggle on like these disciples and forget to talk to the Savior about it. Ask him to help. These sailors had just learned the lesson that despite all their ability, it was in Christ alone that the power lay. He had said to them earlier, let us go to the other side. That indicates that all would arrive. For he is God and there can be no doubt. But their faith failed in the swell of the storm. See, the Lord said, let us go. He wasn't saying, let me go. It was, and, but the, the sailors hadn't tweaked to, to those words. One thing we find as we read the scriptures, Lord Jesus Christ never wastes words. And he arose. How much more would those words come to mean later on as we consider the third day of in the tomb? How much more they mean to us in this day and age? He arose. And he rebukes the wind and the waves, which on the first investigation may seem a little odd. But here is the divine creator speaking to his creation. And they instantly obey the master's voice. A rebuke for the wind brings, brings stillness and peace to, the, to be still to the sea brings great calm. In a moment, the sea went from a thrashing, violent storm to being completely quiet. It never instantly stops if you go to, to the seaside. Have you ever seen a storm at the end of the sea? The wind drives the, drives the waves and the waves crash onto the beach. Once the wind dies down, it doesn't go calm immediately. Not so when the Creator speaks. When Jesus said, be calm to the peace, be calm to the sea, it absolutely went blah, blah, flat calm. There's no delay. It's immediate, and we'll see that same immediacy coming out in all these, uh, this whole narrative. Every time the Lord speaks, and we've seen this in the past, every time he speaks, what he says is instant. And the peace and stillness that was demonstrated by the Lord as he slept is reflected in the elements around them. It's also relevant that Jesus is seen to have power over the air and the sea. In those days, and in some cases, there are places today that many false religions will worship one or the other. The Lord demonstrates his power over all of nature. He's master of all. The failure of the disciples, after all they had seen and done personally, they had come off the back of seeing many healed and wonderful miracles. They had been selected personally by the Lord to be among those who went everywhere with him. They had been given power and authority to go out and heal and to preach to the people a short while before. And had come back full of the stories of those they had helped and those who had believed. And yet here we see them fearful and concerned that the master did not care. Think about the opposition to the saviour, but you don't maybe think it in these terms. But that must have stung the saviour. Master, don't you care? How often can we be accused of saying the same thing in our attitude to our Saviour? 
The whole premise of, premise of his coming was because he loved as no other. And the scripture taught us earlier on that the coming Messiah had come to save the lost. Notice the action. He first calms a storm and then addresses his disciples because of the, their fear. Matthew records that he highlights they had little faith, as does Luke. But in Mark, the words used are no faith. They evidently had faith in him on previous occasions. So he just doesn't accuse them of no faith at all. Just no faith in this particular situation. I suggest the very point of waking him identified that they thought he was able to save. But I'm sure they had no idea of what he was capable of as you see their response. It reminds us of our weakness and failings, how easy it is to go from the heights of the mountaintop experiences and the joy of knowing our Lord and his goodness through to the valley of the shadow of death so quickly. Both require faith and trust that he who has promised will keep us. One commentator noted that there was only one thing more fearful than being in a boat in a storm was having God in the boat because they feared. It tells us clearly in those final verses of, of, of Mark 4. Uh, why, do you, why are you so fearful? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Real fear. And rightly so, as they discovered that this one who they were following, the one they had committed themselves to, genuinely had power over all things. Over things that they had never seen before. In the next three instances of the Lord healing, of the Lord heals people, all of them fall down at his feet in humble submission. But we do not see his disciples do this. Despite their perilous position, they accuse him of not caring how far from the truth. And this will be highlighted to a greater degree in these next few verses. His compassion for man at the lakeside, the woman on the, with the ongoing health crisis, and the father fearful of the loss of his young daughter. In the Domaniac of, at the country of the Gadarenes, the Lord's power to restore the mind and control over demons. Here is the one that the Lord had come to see. Here is the one that he said, let us go to the other side for. A man who was running wild and out of his mind. There was no controlling him. There was none that could control him and nothing could contain him. It's abundantly clear from scripture that he would destroy anything they put in his way. No man could, get, could keep him under control. And he was causing great problems in the area. People couldn't go past that way because he uh, would affect them. He would chase them. There have been a number of people to date in the narrative that Jesus had cast evil spirits out of or demons out of, but none so far in a sad state as this man. He had evidently fallen into the hands of these legion of demons. We're not told why or how. There's no backstory here. Just the hard facts that serve as a warning to those who would trifle with these things, to those who would deny that there are evil spirits in, this, in the realms that we don't deal with, or shouldn't deal with, and shouldn't treat that spirit world lightly. Matthew notes two men, but Mark deals with only one of them. He deals with the outcome from that meeting. And the name of the man indicates the state he is in, Overcome by legion, many demons driving the man to madness. Like many, he would be shunned by society and cut off for fear and lack of understanding. But the Lord knew his plight and came across the seat to meet him. We were reminded last week that the Pharisees accused the Lord of casting out devils by the power of Satan. The Lord proved that that's not possible to do. And in this instance, we see the power of Satan and the ability to affect a man overcome by the, fire, the power of God. Demons are drawn to God and acknowledge who he is. 
He is the son of God and they acknowledge that. They fall down before him. The terrors of the legion of demons fall down and worship the creator of all things. They ask to be allowed to stay in the region and not return to the place they belong. Being free in this world was better than being tied up in, in, the, in the spirit world. Being, to free to, uh, being allowed to roam free to affect and affect another. As they had this man, they would try and affect another if they were allowed to roam free. They know the Son of God would not permit it and therefore look for an alternative. He gives them permission to enter into what are considered unclean animals. And they stampede, these uh, swine stampede over the cliff. The Lord Jesus allows them to enter the, the pigs, uh, but the agents of Satan are drowned as the, as the pigs drown, and he removes them from the scene. But once again, we see the power of God in the Lord. In the disciples, we see him act on their behalf and save them from certain drowning as they saw it. And in this man, we see the power of God over Satan and his ability to save those who are deemed completely lost and untouchable. It's interesting to know that the Savior is brought to the man by the efforts of the disciples in the boat and their influence would appear to carry on as this man is found sitting at the feet of the Lord in his right mind and fully dressed, his soul taken care of, his mind healed, his body covered. He's dressed in his right mind at the feet of Christ. And I think it would be clothing probably supplied by the disciples that he was likely to be wearing. What a delightful picture of the work of the church as we bring Christ to the lost and he saves them and restores their soul. And the, and the church follows up, up on the man with appropriate provision for his immediate physical need. We live in a world where many are having a tough time where the demons of, of drink or drugs affect them badly. So often they're rejected by society. So often we reject them. We walk by them. We ignore them. We don't want to talk to them because we don't know what to say. But here the Savior goes and deals with this man's need, the need of his soul. He's sitting in his right mind. What a joy. He's sitting humbly at the feet of the Savior, dressed. He's been provided for. But they bring the Savior to him first. The one with demons is restored. The ones that have a normal life do not want to do, have anything to do with them. Quite honestly, that probably in this day and age shows that it hasn't really changed. The sad part in all this is the attitude of those in that region. Instead of rejoicing in the restoration of a fellow human being, being back in his right mind, celebrating the fact that they could now walk freely along the trail without fear of attack, they come in fear of the Lord. And having just lost a considerable amount of their financial income, their motivation becomes clear. They don't want to be disturbed. They don't want their lives upset. They don't want change. This one who could restore the soul was not for them. He would disrupt life too much. And they plead with him to leave the area. And that would be the same when we quite often we see that when we're talking to people in the town. When we're talking to people at work, they're not interested. They don't want us to know who the Savior is. Life is good. Life is easy for them. But I love the desire of this man to follow the one who restored him. That delight we have when we are saved, a desire to know more, to follow the Lord for his grace to us. But in this man's case, the Lord sends him back to where he came from as a witness to all that he has done. This man was to be that lamp on the hill, the proof of the power of God, the evidence of what changes have been made in him, this unchangeable, this untamable man was now in his right mind. The Lord in his graciousness does not take the light away from that area completely. Whilst they despised him and asked him to leave, despite the people of the area, 
requesting him to leave. In love, the Lord leaves them a reminder of his power. And I have no doubt there will be those in the region who will see the evidence of that power in this man and be converted. I notice the Lord is gracious in refusing this man's evident desire to follow him. He encourages him to do something he had not been able to do for some time. He says, go home. That may have been something he longed for, may have been something he feared. He had been living in uncompromising circumstances and hardship among the dead in caves, and now he would be able to go home. A place of comfort with the family around and better conditions than the caves and the tombs, for sure. But there may have been an element of fear as he heads home to face those who knew what he'd been like and may have difficulty accepting him as a changed man. That did not mean it would be easy. It would be hardest to convince those, convince those who knew him best. He was able to tell the gospel to those he would live among again, the evidence of the great things done to him for him and the compassion of Jesus would be apparent to all he met. And we're told later on in that passage, and all marveled at what had been done for this man. I was reminded that there's none so broken that they cannot be reached, but there are many who will not be reached because they don't recognize that they're broken. But I did rejoice that at the, at the end, when the Lord Jesus got back into the boat and went to the other side, there was a light left on in that area. The next one, the person we come to is this woman with a hemorrhage of blood, the Lord's power to restore the body scene. In the next two instances of the gospel passages, Mark narrates the first part of the coming of a leader in the synagogue, Jairus. And then on, to, on the journey to his house, the Lord is delayed by the throng and by the delivery of a woman from a long-standing medical condition that cannot be dealt with by the profession of the day. Indeed, we're told that she has been to many physicians and they all failed. And she had got worse and spent all her, all her money trying to find one who was able to restore her to health. But there was none. Once again, the Lord comes back and begins teaching at the edge of the sea. And as ever, large crowds gather to listen and to see who would be healed or what would be done. We shall look at the request of Jairus and the result of it as one and look at the healing of the woman first. The issue of blood makes her unclean in the sight of the law, so unable to meet with others. That's been isolating for, for years. She's considered an outcast. She, had, she didn't want to be an outcast, that's for sure. She had tried every, with every effort to be restored to health, but was not. And we're told she is continuing to deteriorate. But she's drawn to Jesus, not because she recognizes him necessarily as the son of God, and particularly at this point. But she believes that he does have power to heal. And there was a lot of evidence around suggesting that he could. In her unclean state, she could not expect to go direct, but decides that by touching the hem of his garment it should be enough. In her mind, if he is genuinely has the power to heal, then just that touch should be enough. She could sneak in and sneak out, and if it worked, well and good. If not, she was no worse off. It had to be worth a try. She was death desperate, but came in faith and hope that all she had seen and heard would benefit her as well as those who she had seen are benefiting from meeting the Lord. Having touched his garment, she was immediately healed and with a sense of understanding that she had been completely healed. She knew in herself, we're told, fully restored to health, without any of the investigation or questioning that would have come if she'd gone to another physician. Free at last to meet, Free at last to be back in society, healed of the issue that had prevented her 
that's from socializing with others, from going to the synagogue, how her life would have been changed with just a touch. The touch of the hem of his garment by faith in the ability of the one who wore it. Notice not the garment that healed, by the way, because we are told the power had gone out of the Lord and he knew it. The stores of his mercy and his, his compassion are unfathomable, but even a small amount goes out and he knows. The Lord asks, who touched him? And the disciples are looking around going, um, yeah, you're being thronged. What do you mean, who touched you? And despite what they had recently witnessed, immediately jumped to that physical conclusion. What do you mean, who touched you? They had not considered that the Lord knew that someone had looked for healing, and he knew it. They did not see past the jostling crowd to the woman who had bent over to touch the hem of his garment. The one who would be healed. They were confused, but neither the Lord nor the lady are. He knows that power has gone out, and she knows she has received it. When she falls down at his feet, trembling, and confesses what she did and why, and the Lord commends her for her faith. And it's recorded in the scriptures forever. It's wonderful to see that she was not just feeling a little better, but this issue would never recur. The Lord had calmed the storm and healed the man on the other side, on the other side of the sea. He could also say, go in peace and be healed. And with certainty as God and creator, she would never be troubled by this ailment again. In this passage, we see that profound picture of the sinner, cut off from God because of sin, doing all they can to try and be right with God, doing good, being highly riches, trying every way to be healed from the disease of sin that binds and controls. And no matter how hard a person trials, tries, they're unable to shift it. There is no cure. And like this woman, it gets worse. In faith and confession, we see life restored and the ability to be whole. This woman has a new relationship with God through faith and trust. It is this that reminds us of our conversion and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone. His mighty work on the cross for us uh, and for, through, for sin meant that all our sins and griefs were borne by him. And the power of salvation through his cleansing blood and indwelling of the spirit mean we're able to go in peace and are healed and that we have eternal life in glory. Praise the Lord for his goodness to us. And that is still available today. The final situation we consider is the faith of Jairus, the Lord's power to restore the spirit. The Lord and his disciples have just got off the boat and are immediately thronged as usual. And also, it's in the middle of this crowd, many who would recognize him, that Jairus goes. There is a man with a difficulty. He has a daughter who is young and seriously ill and described as being on the edge of death. But as a leader of the synagogue, he would be in no doubt of the stories he had heard about the Lord Jesus, of the numbers healed by him, Many who may have returned to the synagogue because they were healed of a disease like leprosy and now free to go amongst the people again. Because before they would have been prevented because they would have been seen as unclean before they met the Lord. And they would go tell how this man restored them. But he would also be in a difficult place because as a leader of the synagogue, he would know that the leaders would want this man, rid of this man. They would be afraid of him. We're told previously they wanted to kill him. This man, is, but this man is in dire straits, but his daughter comes first. Thankfully, he goes to the Lord and he says uh, that, she's in, that if he comes and just touches her, she'll be healed. But he's obviously aware that she's going to die or about to die if the Lord doesn't come. And because he says, if you touch her hand, she shall live. So he's pretty sure that she's in, this, in the situation that she will die. There's no doubt that the Lord understands the urgency. 
because the wording indicates that she is on the point of death and Jesus is happy to go with him. It's during this time of traveling and being held up by the crowd as they push and shove around him in excitement and wonder that the woman who was seeking healing comes and further delays progress. No one who comes to the Savior is ever turned away. Even if they don't receive what they expect, Jesus always deals with their requests, problems, or accusations. I was thinking of the, the young man who asked the Lord how to be saved, how should he inherit eternal life? He got the answer, he didn't like it. The Lord stopped and answered his questions. At this point, from a human perspective, Jairus must have been getting frantic at the delays and no doubt wishing that they could just get a move on. When he hears the news that his daughter has died, all his rushing to get this one and whom he is putting his faith in to heal his daughter was to no avail. His only daughter, about 12 years old, had just died while the Lord was delayed on the way. Sad situation for anybody. The words of those who come to see him indicate they should, that he should just come away, grieve privately with the family and, and, and leave the master alone. Staying in the crowd would not help. The teacher could be of no help now. She was dead. No one had ever been raised from the dead by the Lord so far in his walk here that we know of. The man is near enough to Jesus for him to hear the words of those who came to tell Jairus of the dead. And as soon as he had dealt with the woman, he turns immediately to him and encourages him to continue believing. Faith, not fear, is Jesus' encouragement. Jesus' encouragement is to believe that he can do more than he believes. When he arrives at the house with those three disciples, Peter, James, and John, having prevented all the others from following him, which I no doubt would have been difficult as they tried to, to throng him, he finds a number of people in the family wailing and weeping as the norm in their society. I don't know whether you've ever watched any news footage when you, they show you pictures of the Mid Middle East and, and children or people, uh, fathers and sons have been killed. Uh, killed. You see much weeping and, and wailing. And it's pretty much the, the scene the Lord came across. And that's fairly normal uh, for that society. Wailing and weeping for the lost. The Lord casts them out and ignores the ridicule and laughter. As he said, she's asleep and they know she's dead. This was, a hope, this was hopeless, and Jairus was wasting the teacher's time. But Jesus doesn't want a rebel audience and proceeds with just the disciples and their parents. And he takes the girl by the hand and restores her to life. It's very easy to read glibly over this passage. The Lord returns the, the eternal spirit of this dead young child to the body to which it came in the presence of five witnesses. That is fantastic. That is awesome. That is God. This had never been recorded as being done by Jesus previously. So it was in far in excess of what could be expected by Jairus and anybody else. The Lord had proved he was in control of nature as they traveled across, across the lake. And having demonstrated his power over demons that afflicted the man at the lakeside and shown time and again his ability to heal perfectly as he had the woman at the wayside. He proves his power as God who breathed life into Adam. Yet by his ability to return the life of this young girl. This account by the eyewitnesses of the events should cause us to think more upon the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's there to challenge all who are not sure who he is with the proofs of who he is in these passages. He is the Messiah. He is the sent one of God. He is the servant of God, promised in times past, come to earth to seek and to save the lost. 
Once more, with, as with all these case, cases, the restoration is immediate. There was no line to restore health because of the weakness or gentle recovery program. They were to give her something to eat. The Lord recognizes in his humanity that the child would be hungry after a period of being ill, maybe for some time. So she encourages to feed her. She gets up and walks and she eats. That's a real demonstra demonstration of who she is and that she is alive. There is no ghost able to get up and walk physically and be seen eating. We're left in no doubt as to the reality of her resurrection from the dead. And as with so many other occasions, there is a sense of fear and wonder at the power displayed by the Lord Jesus. An overwhelming joy as that child is restored. But as you've looked at these passages today and seen the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, do you worship him? As we recognize his power and majesty, his authority over all things, let us rejoice that he is God who saves, not just for this life, but for eternity. Let us be encouraged to, by, to a sense of reverential fear and wonder that he came to die for sinners that they could go free, that we could go free. May we be blessed as we consider the perfect servant, his power, and the response to his uh, acts of kindness and goodness to those he came to save. Let me pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for these wonderful displays of the power uh, that was in him. Uh, those displays that identify him as the only one who was God. Only God could do, could calm nature and the storm. Uh, could restore a man to his right mind. Could heal a woman perfectly. Could give life to the dead. Oh, Father, this morning, we pray that as we uh, consider him, we might rejoice. We might be thankful that he came, that he might save the lost, that we, might, that we have come to know him as our own personal saviour, that we have been given access to God, uh, that one day we will be in glory with him. Father, we pray that the scriptures might challenge us to study more, that for those who don't know you, that they might understand the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that the uh, answer to their soul has to be dealt with, and that he has power to save the lost, to restore life, to heal, to rescue from the storm. Father, we thank you for our Savior. We do pray now that as we depart, you give us strength for this week, uh, that in your will, we do pray that we would just know your blessing. We pray for Winston. We ask that you'll encourage him and strengthen him and Tina too. But Father, we thank you for all your goodness to us. In Jesus' precious name, giving thanks. Amen.